Hello, fellow students of history. This lecture concerns the early Spanish colonies in the New World as a precursor to the English colonies and what would become, what will become the United States of America. Oftentimes when we study history, we can become so focused upon our, our events, um, the people that we're studying, um, the nations under, under study, that we forget what's happening in a larger, the larger scope, um, on the periphery, across the borders, across the, the oceans. The Spanish set the stage in many ways for the English enterprise. The Spanish are there a hundred years before um, the English arrive in what is now New England and the United States on the East Coast. So this lecture concerns the Spanish and what will become our modern day Latin America. The early exploration and colonization of the Americas. So as I said in my introduction, the English enterprise in early America does not happen in a vacuum. It's, large, it's part of a larger European enterprise to discover, to explore, and even to exploit um, this thing, this physical body they call the New World. And why do they call it the New World? Well, it's obvious, right? They didn't know it existed beforehand. When Ferdinand and Isabella send Columbus out in 1492, Columbus and most Europeans believed, thought that the only thing separating them from Asia was the Atlantic Ocean. And so when Columbus sets sail west for Cathay, Cathay which was China and in India, in the Spice Islands, when he lands in the Bahamas, he thinks he lands in India. And that's why American natives are mistakenly called Indians because Columbus thought he landed in India. Um, when Europeans realized that this was actually a new place, their, their minds were blown and they called it the new world. I often think what it would, would have been like to discover a whole, not just an island or a group of islands or a large islands, but discover from the European perspective, um, a whole new continent. What was that like in Europe? I think it would be like as if we discovered a new dimension and we can walk through that dimension and, and encounter new peoples and new civilizations. It actually was that exciting. If you read the literature and look at the paintings of the day, um, European thinkers and peoples and artists were energized. They were so excited about the possibilities of this new place. From their, from their perspective, it was new, of course. Of course, from the perspective of Native Americans, um, no one discovered them, right? That's like a stranger coming to your house who you've never met before and proclaiming he discovered you. You're like, what? Discovered? No, this my house, man, and I've been here for 30 years. What do you mean? Well, you're, you're new to me, so you're my discovery. Well, from, from the Native perspective, they weren't discovered. From the European perspective, this was all, all new territory. And their imaginations were blown. They didn't know what to expect. They thought they were monsters. The Spanish believed that perhaps a new world was a realm of Satan. And the possibilities were endless. So the Spanish come over, as I said, the first European to be commissioned to set sail westward was Columbus. And the territory that the Spanish found in the New World, today Latin America, stretching from Mexico all the way to the tip of Argentina, um, was called New Spain, Nueva España. Later on, as we'll get to in our le next lecture, the English come over. Um, of course, all of Europe hears about the exploits of Cortes in Mexico 
in the vast amounts of gold and land, and resources, and also the exploits of Pizarro in, in Peru as he conquers the Incan Empire. And these tales go back to England and Germany and the Netherlands and spark the imagination of Europeans. And the English Puritans are being persecuted by the crown in England. And let's go to the new world where we can be free of persecution, where we can have our own lands to farm and be our own people and worship God as God leads us in this new area, this new promised land, New England. Not very inventive, New England, New Spain, but those names can tell us a lot. As Europeans venture into this, this new territory, they must have been filled with, with anxiety and fear about what they might encounter away from family, away from their mothers, away from friends. Um, of course, some of those people came with them, but away from anything that was dear to their hearts. It, so when they land in this new territory, they attempt to create the societies they left behind and naming the new lands that they come to discover from their perspective, um, naming these new lands with names from the motherland they left, um, I think brings them some sort of peace of mind and alleviates anxieties. And I'm thinking about the immigration experience, leaving the cherished homeland and coming to a vastly um, different and new territory. I think names matter to these first colonists and explorers as they attempt to recreate what they left behind. Now let's, let's compare um, the Spanish and what will become the Latin America, um, New Spain, and the British, the English, um, and what will become the United States of America. Because they, they do have different agendas in, in many ways. So let's compare the Spanish and the British. In 1492, Columbus lands in the Bahamas. He's commissioned by Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, after many failed attempts, um, the French crown, the crown in Portugal, um, declined um, Columbus's mission to go west and find a new route to um, India and China. Finally, in the second attempt of trying to persuade Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain, they agree to fund his enterprise. Um, Ferdinand and Isabella are ecstatic they had just kicked every Muslim and Jew out of Spain, and they um, purified Spain um, both racially and religiously for God, for the Pope, for Spain, for Jesus, for the Virgin Mary. And they're riding upon that excitement, and they fund Columbus to find a new routes to India and China. In 1607, what's that, like 115 so years later, um, I'm not very good at math. The English found Jamestown. At first, when the Spanish come over to the New World, um, they're, they are men. Um, they are young soldiers, mostly young men looking for adventure and gold. Part of a nation persecuting Jews and Muslims, as I just said, in 1492, um, Ver Ferdinand and Isabella kicked every Jew and Muslim out of Spain, and those who wanted to stay because they were Spanish, right? They, they were Jews and Muslims, but they, their families had gone back centuries in Spain. This was their home, but they were forced to leave. But those who wanted to stay were forced to convert to Catholicism. But many Jews didn't because this was their cherished religion. This was the religion of their fathers. So outwardly, they pretended to convert to Catholicism in order to stay and, re and keep their jobs and their homes and their lands and, and their wealth. But at home, secretly practiced Judaism. And this was the start of the Inquisition because some neighbors told on them and got back to the Catholic Church. And 
Many Jews were killed during this time called the Inquisition, burnt at the stake, tortured, and, and a great portion of those people who survived um, sailed to Latin America, to this new territory. Unfortunately, the Inquisition followed them. And in downtown Mexico City, after the Spanish conquered the Aztecs, um, many Jews were burnt at the stake. Which a horrible, horrible chapter in Mexican history. So the conquistadors who come over from Spain are part of the persecution, right? Not from their perspective, because they believe they're doing God's work. They believe that they are missionaries in the same um, lights, the same type as the Old Testament um, followers of Yahweh who are coming out of the promised land. And God tells them, I've given you a promised land, but there are people living there now. Um, they were unclean. They worship false gods. I want you to go out and wipe them all out. Babies, mothers, grandparents, even sheep and cattle. I want nothing left. And so this is a type of soldier for God the conquistadors are. They have a sword in hand. They're looking for gold. And they believe that they're led by God and the Virgin Mary to do God's work. Different in many ways from the Puritan and pilgrims who come to New England, to found New England. At first, mostly men at Jamestown. But thereafter, many family units, different than the Spanish, when the, when the Spanish first come, they don't come in family units. They come as men, mostly young men, looking for adventure and gold. But the English bring their families. Puritans fling religious persecution. So the Puritans and pilgrims, unlike the conquistadors are not of the persecuting national unit. They're fleeing the persecuting nation. They're fleeing the monarch who is persecuting them and looking for a new home to practice their religion. Remember, keep in mind, it's an, it's an error to think that the Puritans come over um, to establish a nation where everyone is able to practice their religion freely. They're not. The, the Puritans are adamant that their way is the only way, as, of course, many Christian denominations are. Um, this is essential to Christianity. If you read the New Testament, right, it's the only way. So they don't come here to establish a religious, religious haven. They come to the new world to practice their religion freely. Because as you'll, if you read um, more history on your own, you'll see that the Puritans actually began persecuting the Quakers, who they believed were um, practicing a false religion and actually killed Quakers. There was conflict between Quakers and Puritans um, during this, this formative time in the English colonies. And these early English groups hated Catholicism. They hated the religion of the, of the conquistadors in Spain. Um, during the Reformation, when Northern European countries broke away from the control of Rome and the Pope. Uh, many reformers be believed and wrote um, tracts describing the Pope as the Antichrist and Rome as the great whore of Babylon mentioned in Revelation. And in fact, if you read your American history, uh, for, for a very long time in America, Christmas was not practiced. Of course, now Christmas is considered a very Christian holiday. And there's even political debate on um, unchristian forces trying to take away Christmas every year, right? But the English Puritans and, and pilgrims would have seen, they've, they viewed Christmas as a Catholic holiday and a, a devilish holiday. They wouldn't touch it, right? That wasn't their holiday to practice. Not until the the late 19th century and early 20th century, um, mid 19th century, the Americans began to um, somewhat um, observe Christmas. Conquistadors, soldiers who destroyed civilizations and robbed resources. Right? They were soldiers, they came to, to exploit, to gather resources and destroy things. Um, they believed they were doing the work of God. And they, before they encountered Mexico, 
they already had the belief um, from centuries of fighting Islam in Spain, they already had the belief that they were soldiers of God and they were on a mission to fight the devil. And when they get to Mexico, one of the greatest coincidences, coincidences to me in all of history is what they see in Mexico in their minds solidifies that they are fighting the devil because they see statues of, of um, dragons that Mexicans worship and they hear of human sacrifices and all these things confirm to them that they are fighting the devil and they break things. They, just, they destroy in many ways or they cripple and transform in twisted ways the native religions and cultures of the Mayans and Aztecs and Zapotecs and Mixtecs and create something new um, that would become Mexican culture and Latin American culture. It wasn't all destruction, right? Even though there's a lot of destruction, it was the start of a new syncretic, syncretic, which means a, a coalescence, a combining of cultures from two different, two uh, opposite or div divergent cultures coming in to create a new culture. And this is what happens in Mexico. This is not, this has not happened in New England. In Mexico, because, well, I'll get to this. I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> So those people who come over with the Spanish are conquistadors. Those who come over um, from England, common folk, farmers, pastors, skilled workers, whole communities come over to do what? To establish new English communities. They come to establish communities where the Spaniards don't necessarily come to spend in the early times early part of the colonial project, the Spaniards don't necessarily come over to establish communities. They come as soldiers. So I'll read this again. Common folk, farmers, pastors, skilled workers, indentured servants, and some soldiers too, of course, who came to plant their culture on new soil, New England. On the Spanish side, they're Catholics. And they come with evangelical mission. Now, this might be different than what you're thinking what evangelism is. Uh, of course, we, at the very core, evangelism is spreading the gospel of Christ, right? The great commission given to the apostles in Acts chapter 2, Jesus says, go out into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Um, those who believe will be saved and those who believe not will be damned. And these signs will follow. And that's Acts chapter 2. Um, this is a great commission given to um, Christians. So when the Catholics come over to Mexico, they come with evangelical fervor. They come to destroy things, to gather gold, but also to convert. They come with conversion fervor. Um, and priests come with the conquistadors to, 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 to break things and to convert to um, what they see as the children of the devil, but to take them away from the clutches of the devil and save them. It wasn't all benevolent, so, as we'll see, right? If you read more Latin American history. The English are Anglicans. Anglicans that means the Church of England, or another word for the Church of England is Episcopalian. Um, but Anglican, High Anglican is in many ways like Catholicism because it was at one time. King Henry VIII, for various reasons we won't go into because it's not this class, but King Henry VIII broke away from Rome. And when you walk into an Anglican church, it feels like a Catholic church in many ways because at one time it was. But there are certain things that are different. Um, the Pope is no longer the head of the Anglican church right? The Bishop of Canterbury is, and the Queen of England, the Monarch of England. Those are the, the heads of the, of the Anglican Church. Um, many things that had to do with um, veneration of Mary and saint veneration are gone from the Anglican Church. And of course, all the gold that used to flow from England to Rome, to pay Rome, um, then at that time stayed within England. Um, Anglicans and Puritans, Congregationalists, these are all products of the Reformation. These are Protestants 
the word Protestant means a protester against the Catholic Church. That's how they got the name, right? Anglicans, Puritans, Congregationalists, Lutherans, Methodists, these were all early um, reformers, Calvinists. And these pastors set on guiding their congregations. This is their mission. The religious leaders, leaders that come with the English come to found new English societies, to be leaders of Puritans in the new world. They don't necessarily come with evangelical fervor to convert the natives. This is not their mission, as it is the mission of the Catholic priests and friars who come to the new world. In, in fact, an interesting chapter in colonial New Spain after Cortes conquers the Aztecs, um, the Spanish friars and monks in Spain are ecstatic from what, if we can take the original sources at face value somewhat, right? They're excited um, at the possibilities of conversion in the new world. Cortes brings in 12 young Franciscan monks. And they believe that they have a commission from God, like the original 12 apostles. And they believe that they will see miracles happen. The dead will be raised, the, the crippled will, be, will walk again, the handicapped. Um, and they come with that kind of fervor to convert. Several decades go past and none of this really happens. And of course they're downcast and depressed, but at first they were full of evangelical fervor. These are all major differences between the two enterprises. From the very start, when Columbus lands in the Bahamas, there is, there is conflict with the natives. Um, from, well, some historians say, well, from 1519, when, when Cortez lands at Veracruz, that's when we can start this age of conflict, but we'll go back to Columbus. Columbus and his men were brutal. They were brutal to the, to the natives. Horrific. We have stories that, come, that came down from observers that say whole villages, whole villages of natives committed suicide when they heard the Spanish were coming because they had already heard stories of how Spanish conquistadors were raping Indian women and enslaving the men. And they were. So whole villages all committed suicide rather than to suffer under the Spanish. On the English side, almost from the very start also, um, the English Puritans and the English made war um, and conflict occurred, right? Because natives are already living there. This is someone's home already. People already living in these places and new people from outside come in and set up shop, start cutting down trees and gathering resources. At first, um, there, there was friendly interactions. Native Americans showed Puritans how to farm, how to gather. But of course, as populations grow, as pure, new Puritans, Puritan towns are, are created, as babies are born, and more resources are needed to feed their growing population. There's conflict with the natives and people die. And this lasts from 1622 to 1924 as manifest destiny, as we'll discuss in a later um, lecture, pushes Americans westward to conquer the continent from East Coast to West Coast and everyone in the way convert or die, or be placed on environmental ghettos called reservations. On the English side, enslaved native people, oh, sorry, the Spanish side, enslaved native peoples under the encomienda system, interbred with natives since scarcity of Spanish women, and many conquistadores married Aztec nobility after the conquest. On the English side, attempted at first to enslave peoples, 
right, but failed. Compared to New Spain, very little inbreeding. Why was there very little inbreeding? Well, because um, the English brought their women. The Spanish didn't bring their women, so this is what soldiers historically did in war, in battle, is rape. And this is the beginning of the Mexican, the new Mexican culture, right? Most Mexicans um, have a combination of European and native blood. I recently did, recently did my um, ancestry DNA test and it just confirms what I already knew, right? I'm um, 44% 44, 44 Spanish, 3% European Jewish. I have French and Italian and Basque. My European blood comes out to about 52% and my native blood to about 41%. I'm pretty much split down the middle with a little more European than, than Indian, Native American. And this is, this is because the Spanish, and my, you already said, right, the European blood is about 44% Spanish. I'm a direct consequence of, of the conquest. Um, not so in the English colonies who, who brought their English women. Of course, there were some interbreeding, but not on the scale uh, seen in Mexico. On the Spanish side, the new world seen as fantastical, as you can imagine, it's a new world. Their minds are blown in Europe. What do we expect? Are there monsters? Are there cyclops? Are there sea monsters? Are there cities of gold? Right? Once they conquer Mexico and, they, and shiploads of gold go flooding into Spain, what else is out there? And the idea that there's a, a city of gold sparks the imagination of Spaniards for centuries, actually as they go looking for the city of gold, El Dorado. The new world seen as fantastical and the realm of the devil. Natives viewed as children of Satan who needed conversion. A syncretic folk Catholicism emerges in Mexico. The Mexican culture in many ways is, a, is syncretic, a coalescence of Spanish culture and native cultures may combine into one. The Virgin of Guadalupe is the prime example of a syncretic coalescent um, religious deity. The Virgin of Guadalupe, the European Virgin Mary is combined with the Aztec um, earth goddess Tonantzin. And this gives us um, the Virgin of Guadalupe. On the English side, the new world is seen as fantastical, again, of course, and the realm of the devil, especially the wilderness. If you read, the early writings of the Puritans on the wilderness, the forest, is, is, a, is a realm of, of the devil. And this goes back to superstition, right? You can read um, Grimm's Brothers' fairy tales, and they're very dark. This takes place oftentimes in the forest. And go back to the New Testament. The idea of the wilderness is where the devil is. Where does Jesus go to be tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights? the wilderness, the desert, outside the urban zone. Outside the urban zone is where the devil lives. It's, it's, it's primal, it's natural, it's base. And of course now, right, um, in America, we, I think we have a different idea of the wilderness. To us, the forest, Yosemite, Yellowstone, these are, these are the opposites. They're places of the divine. They're, they're outside cathedrals, um, but not, not so to the Puritans. The Puritans see the wilderness as the realm of the devil. And it's not always, but um, most often. And this also goes back to European superstition. When we think of Puritans, we think of Puritans who are 100% Puritan, who are for 100% the Bible, and, um, but the, but really, in, 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 if we went back in time, many of these Puritans still held medieval superstitious beliefs going back to the Celts, ancient beliefs. Um, there was a common, there was a, a, a mixture of biblical belief and superstitious belief. Right? Natives viewed as savage and antithetical to Christian and English culture. So both the Spanish and English view native, native culture as savage. 
Natives must be removed, not assimilated. Of course, in some places, in some voices want to assimilate the Native Americans, but overall, generally, the natives are viewed as something that must be eradicated. And this also occurs in, in Spain, in New Spain and Mexico. There's wars um, against the natives up until the 20th century, and they were seen as antithetical to progress and they had to be removed. Um, natives must be removed, not assimilated. Protestantism is untouched by native religion. So in Mexico, Catholicism, in many ways, in many instances, uh, mixes with native cultures. And this was, this, this happened throughout the centuries as the religion we know as Catholicism, at one time just Christianity before the Reformation, as Christianity or Catholicism um, saturated Europe, it often um, mixed with the local religious beliefs and icons. There's a great example, a, a, a statue of Apollo was found in the base, a, a basement of the, um, the Vatican, uh, an ancient statue of Apollo, this young, um, handsome God. Apollo's name is scratched off in the name Jesus overimposed, superimposed. This is syncretism, a coalescence of two different religions to create one new one. Reasons why the Spanish and Portuguese start to explore, right? Why did they start venturing out? That eventually led to the discovery and exploration of this thing they call the New World. It was an extension of the Reconquista. In the next slide, we'll talk about the Reconquista. This great energy that was built up over centuries and leashes onto the New World. Curiosity about the African coast. Of course, the Europeans had always known Africa was there. Africa is a, is a Roman word. The Romans knew Africa was there. Um, there were Africans in Rome. It's just across the Mediterranean. But new technologies allow Europeans to sail further along the African coast than ever before, the Western African coast, and all the way down to the tip, and over to India. New technologies, new technologies allow Europeans to sail, to sail around the world like never before. God, gold, glory, slaves, and spices. As Europeans start to discover and explore Africa like never before, things happen. Things happen mentally. Um, Africans began to be enslaved. Africa, African resources began to be exploited like never before. And look at that line, God, gold, and glory, slaves and spices. To many, to many modern Christians, um, that might seem antithetical. Can someone proclaim belief in God and kill in the name of God to gather gold and resources for their nation and be overcome with this great patriotic fervor for their nation, but also believe they're doing God's work? Is that antithetical? Are those two beliefs antithetical or do they complement each other? Something to think about. A desire to bypass Muslim trade routes. So before this age of exploration and conquest and exploitation, um, Europeans had contact with China and India. In fact, the Romans knew China existed. And there's, there's some belief that I've read that the, during the time of Jesus, there were Chinese monks in, in Egypt and Rome. Um, trade routes went all the way to China. And men like Marco Polo and the, um, go to these regions through trade routes and bring back spices to Europe. 
But at this time, the trade routes are cut off by the Islamic leaders who do not want Europeans coming into their territories any longer. And so a new, new routes had to be found to get to China and India across the ocean. And this is the reason why Ferdinand and Isabella send Columbus off is to find a new trade route across the ocean because they couldn't no longer um, traverse the land to get to China and India through Muslim held, Muslim held territories. This is a map of the Reconquista. Now we're, we're going way back, um, switching way back. So in the upper left-hand corner, in the year 711, Muslim armies cross over the Straits of Gibraltar from Africa into Spain and begin to conquer Spanish Christian kingdoms. And so here is the map in 910. And so you see from 711 to 910, Muslim armies and princes and kings conquered this whole territory in gray. And the kingdom of Leon, Navarre, and Barcelona, the county of Barcelona, are Christian-held territories, but most of it is Muslim. Until 1492. So from 711 to 1492, Christian and Muslim armies fight each other. There's not constant warfare. Sometimes they're going to get along. There's give and take. But overall, um, there's conflict as both sides attempt to conquer the whole Iberian Peninsula. This is Iberia. Portugal and Spain is the Iberian Peninsula. Until 1492, we look at the bottom right corner. The only kingdom, the only Muslim held kingdom left in 1492 is the Kingdom of Granada. The whole other territory of Portugal and Spain is now um, Christian once again. And in 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella. We see that huge pink area. They combine their kingdoms and create this powerful kingdom in, in Europe. And they combine forces and kick the Muslims out of Spain. They conquer Granada. And with that great religious fervor of the Reconquista, um, with that, they send off Columbus to find a new route to India and China. Christopher Columbus, he always looks so happy. A few points about Christopher Columbus. He was from Genoa. He was an Italian. He was an Italian commissioned by the Spanish monarchs, merchant and sailor. He proposed a venture to sail west to find a new spice route to, to Cathay, Cathay, China, India, and the Asian Spice Islands. Believed only the Atlantic lay between Europe and Asia. After rejected by England, Portugal, and France, and twice refused by Spain. Finally, in 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella agreed to fund his expedition. August 3rd, 1492, Columbus sets sail from Spain. October 12th, he lands on the island of San Salvador in the Bahamas. He thought he was in India. That is why he called everyone there Indians, mistakenly. The same year, again, 1492, Isabella and Ferdinand kicked all the Jews and Muslims out of Spain. Of course, as I said, those who stayed had, had to convert. Many who converted did so outwardly, but at home practiced their religion. And so we have the Inquisition who killed many of them off when they found out they were lying to the Catholic Church. Columbus's discovery of the New World would lay foundation for the Spanish Empire in Mexico and Peru and spark the imagination of all Europe. Here's some dates for us. The, the words, the dates in red are ones I am going to ask on the test. The, the rest provide a good framework, right? Many his, historians or history professors will say that dates don't matter. Dates matter. They matter to me because what, what dates do is they, they build a framework in your mind, a skeletal framework, like a scaffolding. When a house is first being built, you first have the foundation 
in the framework, those are what, those are what dates provide in your mind. Then on the dates, you can, you can hang the human experience. But without dates, I don't think there's any structure, right? Ideas and events are floating in your mind without any mooring, without any anchor. You need anchors because history is about causality, one event causing another. And without dates, you don't know what comes first or what goes, right? So you need dates. Dates matter. Dates, dates are important, but it, it takes memorization. Old school sitting down at your desk and memorizing. 1492 Columbus um, discovers in quotes a new world. One of Columbus's African servants has smallpox. Within a few decades, up to 95% of the entire native population from Argentina to Alaska is wiped out, up to 95%. Natives have no immunity to typhoid. Sorry, that's a complete um, <laughs> grammatical mistake, so I wrote no in all those. So natives have no immunity to typhoid, flu, smallpox, or the measles. 1519, Hernan Cortez lands in Mexico at Veracruz. And for the next two years, he marches west into Mexico as he hears tales of all this gold. And that's a great story. If you want to read a great epic adventure, read the true history of the conquest of New Spain by Bernal Diaz del Castillo. He was one of Cortez's lieutenants. He was there, and he wrote a, a great history of this time period and the conquest of Mexico. Um, it's a great read. Please read it. Hernan Cortez conquers the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan in Mexico, which is now Mexico City. 1519 and 1522, at the same time, Ferdinand Magellan and crew sail around the world and back. The first man to sail around the world is Ferdinand Magellan. Ferdinand Cortez, conquistador, explorer, adventure seeker, missionary, opportunist, butcher, Christian, general, and loyal subject of Spain. He conquered the Aztecs. This is an early artist rendition of Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, and you can see here, the central plaza and the center of the universe of the Aztec peoples. This major temple, the Templo Mayor. You can go there today and see the ruins. I went there last January. I took my son for two weeks and we explored the center of the Aztec universe. Of course, now uh, most of this lake is gone. This is all Mexico City. A very small portion down here um, is still a lake. You can take boat rides. Xochimilco. But here's Mexico City laid out in a great fashion by Aztecs. This was all lake before they created their home. They started throwing the lake in because the nations around about didn't want them living near them. They were outcasts and they built their city upon a lake. Now the, the Spanish are, are marching toward Tenochtitlan, this city, and hearing rumors of how beautiful it is this whole time period. And so they cross over the mountains, and Bernal Diaz describes this beautifully. They cross over the mountains, and this is what they see. They see this beautiful city on a lake. And many of the conquistadors said that they had never seen a, beauty, a city so beautiful as Mexico City in all their lives. And they had been to many cities around the world. He said it was gleaming, the white stucco buildings were shining in the sun, and they had to pinch themselves because they thought they were living in a Spanish romance novel. And we'll read that here. This is what Bernal Diaz writes when they first see the city for the first time. And when we saw all those cities and villages built in the water and other great towns on dry land, in that straight and level causeway leading to Mexico, Tenochtitlan. We were astounded. 
Those great towns and queues or temples and buildings rising from the water, all made of stone, seemed like an enchanted vision from the tale of Amadis. This was a, a romance, a tale of, of adventure and romance that the Spanish were reading. Spanish adventure romance novels were big in Spain at this time, and many of the conquistadors read these books. So they, they were reading about adventure, and they were on adventure. So this just solid, solidifies in their mind that they were living a Spanish romance novel of adventure. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Indeed, some of our soldiers asked whether it was not all a dream. It is not surprising, therefore, that I should write in this vein. It was all so wonderful that I do not know how to describe this first glimpse of things never heard of, seen, or dreamed before. Look at that city. The Spanish are astounded in amaze and in wonder, in awe at this beautiful city the Aztecs created. And here's the cause way down here he's talking about. You see these little indentations? Well, this whole city was a fortress. Um, in times of conflict, the Spanish, the Aztecs could raise these bridges and the city was impenetrable from the outside. Pretty genius. Now, to me, one of the greatest tragedies in all of history is the Spanish destroyed this city. They destroyed it and built something new in Mexico City. But they, they, they thought it was the most beautiful, beautiful city they ever seen before, and then they went and destroyed it. The name, the name of religion and nation and gold and glory. As we entered the city of Itzapapalpa, the site of the palaces in which they lodged us, they were, so, they were very spacious and well-built. This, this, this is a civilization. The Aztecs built a civilization. These aren't grass huts. And I'm not putting down natives who live in grass huts, but this is a very advanced civilization. There are mathematicians. There are astronomers, there are engineers, there are philosophers, there are poets, there are lawyers. In every type of profession you would need for an advanced civilization, these were the Aztecs. They were very spacious and well-built, of magnificent stone, cedar wood, and the wood of other sweet-smelling trees, with great rooms and courts, which were a wonderful sight and all covered with awnings of woven cotton. Bernal, Dio, Bernal Diaz del Castillo, The Conquest of New Spain. Here's a rendition, a reproduction of um, the great market at Mexico City. And Mexico City still has great markets. And in the background, you can see the Templo Mayor, which is of course a Spanish word, not an Aztec word. Um, the great temple, which was considered the center of the universe, to the Aztecs, where all the major sacrifices took place. And dedicated, you see those two temples at top? They were dedicated to the, the national um, god, the national war god, who we to Pochtli, and the temple right next to it was dedicated to Tlaloc, the rain god, which was a god worshipped throughout um, Mesoamerica from the very earliest days. And you can see the types of foods they were eating, right? You got pheasants, you have fish, of course, from the lake, um, yams, um, of course, um, peppers. Salsa comes to us from the Aztecs, so, so do tortillas. Tamales, those were all Aztec Mesoamerican creations. And you see, the, yeah, these little hairless, plump dogs, that was their source of protein. All, all major um, mammals had died off 15, 10 or 15,000 years before the Aztecs. So there were no beasts of burden or livestock in Aztec culture because they had died off thousands of years before. So this was a major source of protein, these little hairless dogs. <laughs> Chihuahua tacos.
I love this, this scene. You can hear the people talking, the women talking, the children playing. Beautiful. Here is a reproduction of the Templo Mayor that you can go visit today. This is still the center of Mexico City. Of course, these are no longer there. Uh, only the foundations are there. The very foundations of these places are still there. And this, these are the foundations. This is the foundation of this right here. I saw this in person the last time I was there. Here is the god Quetzalcoatl, which was a god that was worshipped from the first of civilization of the Olmecs before the Aztecs, before the Mayans, before the Toltecs were the Olmecs. And this Quetzalcoatl was the major god throughout Mesoamerica, the flying dragon god, the, flood, the feathered serpent. This, this is an actual statue from that time period. And this is the base of the Temple Mayor. One, a major con con consequence of the conquest was, here's the foundation of the Temple Mayor. Um, when the Aztecs were conquered, the Spanish made the Aztecs take down their temple and with the same masonry, build the foundation of the great cathedral you see in the background. It's like the final nail to bring home the conquest. When, you're, when you take down, if you're a conquered people and the conquerors make you dismantle your major religious place and with the same stones build a new religious place dedicated to their religion, that is conquest. Here's another view. Right behind this picture would, is the museum, um, the, a museum to the native peoples, the Aztecs, and the conquest. So this was taken apart to build uh, the main Mexican cathedral you may see in the news today, or it may perhaps you visited. It's a very powerful location. This is Bernal Diaz again describing their entrance. So imagine this standing and the Spaniards walking into this area. The Spanish walked into this area when it was built. And this is what he describes. When we had taken a good look at all this, now they're in the city. They're, they're in this area right here where this photo is taking place. They're in this area. When we had taken a good look at all this, we went to the or orchard and garden, which was a marvelous place both to see and walk in. I, I was never tired of noticing the diversity of trees and the various scents given off by each, and the paths choked with roses and other flowers and the many local fruit trees and rose bushes and the ponds of fresh water lilies, water pads. Sorry, that's a typo. Then there were birds of many breeds and varieties which came to the ponds. Imagine, this, is, sounds, this sounds so beautiful. I say again that I stood looking at it and thought that no land like it would ever be discovered in the whole world. Now listen to this next line and take this in. But today, all that I then saw is overthrown and destroyed. Nothing is left standing. I've read a couple thousand history books in my career. And this is one of the most powerful lines in any book I've ever read, read in any original source documents. Bernal Diaz was around 80 years old when he wrote this. And he wrote this because some other histories had come out by men who weren't there, who just made things up. And he was frustrated, and he wrote this. And his book at first was called um, The True History of the Conquest of New Spain. And so he's 80 years old, around there, looking back and thinking as an old man. And several times throughout his book, you, you, you get a glimpse of perhaps some regret. As, old, as we do as we're old people, we, 
as as we as as um, mortality, the idea of mortality plagues us constantly, and we ex examine our lives and we become very introspective about our deeds and actions and words that we've said in our lives. And I think this is what Bernal Diaz here is doing. He had a, he had a hand in this this destruction. And he remembers how beautiful it was and how the Spanish just destroyed it and nothing is left standing. Powerful. God, glory, and gold, a lesson in historical empathy. So let's, let's revisit this question again. This, this event, the conquest of Mexico, allows us a great opportunity to explore this idea of historical empathy. So place yourselves in the shoes of a 25-year-old Spanish conquistador. Um, generally speaking, this is a believer in Jesus. This is a believer in the church, a believer in the Virgin Mary. He believes that he's being led on a mission to spread Christianity. But also to gather gold and perhaps slaves and resources for Spain and to kill in the name of God, in the name of Christ. Is spreading Christianity, but also killing natives and enslaving natives and gathering gold, are those things antithetical? What do you think? When you think of conquistadors, When you think of conquistadors, do you think their beliefs and actions were contradictory? If so, why? If not, why? Is it possible to be deeply religious and kill, enslave, and rob in the name of God? No, why not? Does true religion need to be peaceful? If so, why? What is true religion? In fact, throughout history, Religion and warfare are inextricably tied together. And I think you've seen this in the past few decades in America when a, a, in a terrorist event happens and people, are, people die in the name of a radical Islam. And you hear someone, on the, perhaps a, an American religious leader comes on and says, this is not true religion. True religion is not violence, but peaceful. Well, my my answer to, answer to that is well, who said who said that religion is not violent? In fact, religion religion throughout history has been very violent, and the violence was not contradictory to religion. Islam historically has been a very has in practice has been very violent. Christianity in practice throughout history has been very violent. In practice. There, there are reasons why we have gods of war. Thor, Odin, Quetzalcoatl, Huitzilopochtli, Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, Athena, Minerva, Ares, Mars, Zeus. These are all violent gods. Gods who are prayed to in ancient times before war, before battles. We learn in grade school and middle, in um, seventh and eighth grade about Greek and Roman mythology, and they seem like cartoon characters to us. They seem like superheroes that are no different than our comic books. But they were, in practice, this was religion. And there were gods of war that were sacrificed to before battles gods of war who were prayed to please help protect us and help us kill as many Celts as we can. So in fact, religion for most of history has been very violent. And when people say, well, true religion is not violent, what does that mean? There's, is there some logos in the sky that this perfect idea of religion that is peaceful? I, I don't think so. Well, it, not in practice, actually, in fact. 
Mars, Aries, Thor, Quetzalcoatl, Huitzilopochtli, St. James, Santiago, the Virgin Mary, Yahweh, Jehovah, all gods of war. Read the Old Testament. Who is this God in the Old Testament? He's violent. He's wrathful. He kills people. He says, go kill babies because they were unclean. The God of the Old Testament is a violent God, a God of war, a national God. Another consequence of the conquest, um, very fascinating. When the Spanish come to Mexico, what would become Mexico? They were very, very concerned about blood purity. This is one reason why Ferdinand and Isabella kick every Muslim and Jew out of Spain because um, they want to purify Spain racially and religiously. And those who are left should be uh, untainted by Jewish blood or Arab Muslim Moorish blood. And if you, are, if you do have a grandparent who's Jewish, then you're not, you're not, you're not hundred percent Spanish, right? You're, you're Jewish and you're tainted. You're unclean somehow. So when the Spanish conquistadors come to Mexico and start interbreeding, I think this causes anxiety in Spain because they were already hyper concerned about blood purity. And this idea of blood purity that the Spanish create first will then influence the English colonies into a great extent um, southern slavery. Um, the KKK, on their major emblem on their, their robe is the blood drop, the blood cross. And the droplet of red blood signifies blood purity. And this can be traced back to Spain and the Spanish in Mexico. Hyper-concern with blood purity. And so this genre of paintings is created in Mexico City, in New Spain, that details the various combinations of racial interbreeding. And there are over 40 castas, or castes, C-A-S-T-E, castes. There are 40 different castes that the Spanish dream up to describe the various combinations of racial intermixing. And I'll just read this. Casta paintings created in New Spain, centered in Mexico City, represented a Spanish fascination, concern, and even anxiety over the mixing of racial, different racial types, and the purity of Spanish blood. Over 40 ca different castas were created, a sy Sistema de Castas. This hyper anxiety of blood purity and light versus dark skin will influence ideas dictating slavery in the English colonies to the North and the Southern United States. And so here we see a Moor, which is a combination of a Spanish father and a mulatto wife. A mulatto is also a different combination. Now, most of these Casa paintings not only are hyper-concerned with interbreeding and the offspring of these interbred unions, but um, historians of material culture love these paintings because they show us how people in colonial New Spain were dressed. So this is how they would have actually been dressed. And most of these paintings, there's some kind of familiar interaction. We see this little boy spitting a spitball to his sister. There's an avocado, which is a new world um, fruit. And the people back in Spain were fascinated by these paintings because it showed them often the, the style of dress in the different fruits and flora and fauna in Mexico. Here's another painting, a mestiza. This girl down here, a mestiza, is a combination of a Spanish father and an Indian mother, a native mother. So many of the Aztecs, after the conquest, they married um, Aztec princesses the daughters of Aztec nobility who were still alive after the conquest and created this new generation of, of Mexicans. Um, I'm a, I, your professor is a mestizo, half European. I'm over 50% European and nearly 50% Indian, native. I am what this child is. Another combination. 
called a throwback, a torno atrás, a Spanish father and an albino mother create, this is, this is not based in science, it's, some of it gets really weird. So if you have an albino mother and a Spanish father, you, they create this very dark child who's a throwback. Fascinating, interesting. In this cast of painting, we see various types of racial mixtures, going from light to dark types, from upper left to bottom right. In cast of paintings, the darker the offspring, the less Spanish blood the person has, until we get to the bottom levels where no Spanish blood runs through the veins and the person is savage-like, barefooted, irrational, and violent. 